Okay, as we take a look now at uh, the book of Ephesians, I want to take a moment and walk you into the story. You remember that Paul began his writing career with First and Second Thessalonians, and he did that during his second missionary journey. He did it between 51 and 54 in the Common Era. This is 10 years later. Uh, he has now written a number of other letters during the third missionary journey that include probably um, uh, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians. Uh, he's written probably Galatians during that time. And, and that third journey was pivotal in moving from the very excite, exciting writings of prophetic thinking of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians to some very polemic writings, some teaching writing some yes Jesus is coming but not right now and so we need to fix what's going on in the church and so we've been looking in first and second Corinthians at how he got under the hood of the church and started to work on it you've been taking some courses to uh, find what he did with uh, Romans as well trying to address the Roman church and get under the hood of that church and and deal with the issues of surrender and how it looks in the life of a believer by the years 61 to 63 we have Paul in a, in a, what's called a light chain arrest. A light chain arrest is that he was arrested and sent to Rome and he was put near the Tiber River. We know the area that, that, was, uh, that belonged to the Jewish community of that time. He was um, staying near the Tiber River in an area where people who were cloth dyers and cloth workers were. There are a number of insulae, uh, large, um, island-like, the word insulus is the word for island, large um, uh, condominium blocks that have been discovered not far from the uh, Jewish community in Rome. And so we know where he was, about where he was. But I want to set you a little bit into that time frame of his life. He had been in the third missionary journey, writing polemic writings to the Romans and Corinthians, probably to the Galatians as well. And then at some point, he had come back to Jerusalem. He was arrested in Jerusalem for taking a Gentile beyond the, the uh, soreg or the balustrade inside the temple. And he was uh, taken off first to the area of Caesarea by the sea. And there he went before Felix and Festus and Herod Agrippa II giving defenses of why he was arrested, trying to explain to them that he had not violated any Jewish laws and they didn't do what he was accused of. At a certain point, Paul probably would have gotten away with what, what the, he was accused of. He probably would have been let off. I'm not trying to say he was guilty, he wasn't. I'm, I'm saying he probably would have beat what the accusations raised against him were. The problem was that partway through the trial, he appealed to Caesar. And that meant all trials are broken off and he is sent to Caesar. And by 61, he is sitting under a light chain, a house arrest. Now this house arrest is, it's not that you can't leave the house because somehow you're dangerous or you'll escape. It's that there is someone who is attached to you and their job as a Roman guard is to get you within the hour in the face of Nero when he calls. Failure to bring the, the, the person who's to be questioned by Nero to the emperor within the specified period of time would cause the death of the person who's guarding you. So they have every interest in keeping an eye on you and never letting you get very far from the palace. Rome and the Palatine Hill where the, the emperors were sitting for much of their time, and of course Nero had a much, much broader area, that he had, um, he had taken on. Rome was undergoing a series of uh, people coming and going constantly on the arteries and veins of the Rome, Roman road system, bringing people that were to be questioned by the emperor because they appealed to Caesar. Only a Roman citizen could do this, and Paul had done it. When he did it, he finds himself under, we'll just call it house arrest. And he's waiting there by the Tiber River, and he can't come and go freely, but he is able to take guests come and go from his house, and they're able to talk to him. And so what happens is he is meeting these delegations from churches and meeting uh, uh, people who are involved in church work. And in the meantime, he's explaining the gospel to these guards that are attached to him. It appears to be a new phase of ministry for Paul. 
because he goes on and says that there are guards that are, and, and the whole household of Caesar is, is becoming aware of the gospel because of my, my light chain ministry. Now, this is a guy who knows how to take <laughs> a, a, an imprisonment and turn it into a ministry. And what I love about this is during that time, he's receiving word about the church at Colossae. He's receiving word about the church at Ephesus or the church at Philippi. And, and he's gonna address a, a certain um, problem that's going on in those churches. And in Ephesus, I want to draw a picture of the problem that he is overcoming. So someplace between 61 and 63 in the common era is the date for the letter to the Ephesians. Paul is in Rome, he's under arrest, he's got time on his hands, and he hears that there are believers in Ephesus that are Gentiles in background that have come to Jesus Christ that are finding Judaizers pressing them and telling them that they are in fact second class citizens. Now by this time Luke has probably already written the Gospel of Luke. Mark is already out on the street, the Gospel of Mark. Um, the book of Acts is already mostly being written or probably finished off during this, uh, this time period of arrest. And so just to set it into the New Testament story, let me just tell you a story about what's going on in the background of Ephesus, and maybe it'll help you. Ephesus is a city that was the major jewel of Asia Minor. It's in Western Turkey today. But Ephesus was a city that was like, um, it was kind of like the Paris, if I can say it that way, of the Roman world. It was a, an older city that had some famous monuments like the temple to Artemis just to the north and east of the city. It had a 25,000 seat theater that you can still go and visit uh, that's, that hugs the side of Mount Peon. It had this sprawling metropolis with an Arcadian way that went down, a marble way that went all the way down like a K out to the, to the piers. It had um, some very large arcades and open forum. This was a really world-class Roman city, Ephesus. The problem was, in addition to being a world-class Roman city, it was a port city, and the port was in decline. So as the port was going down, um, it was, the problem was that the harbor kept silting up. The Caister River brings a lot of silt and it was silting up. And so they had to keep scraping out the harbor in order to keep um, boats able to get up to the caves. Today, if you go to Ephesus, you are a, a, a long distance away from the sea. And there are cotton fields between the Arcadian Way all the way out to the beach. And all of that was the Caister River, but now the river is silted and moved all the way out. And what's important here is uh, he's receiving some messages from Ephesus. And the messages he's receiving are that people are putting down these Gentile background Christians and saying, you're not really as blessed by God. You're not really part of the kingdom of God. Some of the Galatian argument has rubbed off on, on Ephesus if you guys really got your act together, you'd be like us Jewish believers and you would have all the things that we have and all the background that we have in Sabbath and in circumcision and, and in uh, kosher laws and you'd be doing those things. So you have the Ephesian believers that seem to be beat down just a little bit. Now, along with that, I wanna tell you something else. I want you to imagine you're Paul. You're in Rome and you're sitting there under house arrest. Who do you think gets the position of watching this five foot balded Jew with a big nose? Who gets to watch him? The best of the troops? Do you think they take their first frontline troops and make them uh, prison guards? Because they don't. I want you to imagine that there was a methodology of moving people under the occupation of Rome into being a Roman citizen. Follow me for just a second. A lot of words, but to get to something really important. Let's say you're a Gaul. You're a captain of the Gauls. And you are, so we're going to put big fuzzy pelts on you and wild weapons. And you're going to have hair that's all dreads or whatever. And you're, I am a Gaul. Okay, and now you're, we're going to wear bones or I don't know what you, I don't know how you dress. But you're a Gaul and you're a captain among Gauls, a chieftain among the Gauls. Now, Rome comes out to your neck of the woods 
and they start putting up a berm and running roads and, and putting up a stockade fence and, and putting up a series of towers every couple of hundred feet, and they start creating, Rome has come to a village near you. You didn't know this, but welcome to Rome. We brought it to you. Since you didn't come to us, we brought it to you. Now, you're on the frontier. Roman soldiers would be sent out, legionnaires would be sent out, and they would stand against these wild-eyed Gauls, and the Gauls would attack them. And because of the pilum in particular, this long spear that the Romans made, it was very intelligently designed, it had this long spear with this point, but it was almost like a fish hook. The point would go in, but you couldn't pull it back out. So even if you threw a pilum and it went through the guy's shield, it probably would hit him. But even if it didn't, he couldn't get it out. So you can't operate, you can't walk around with a shield with a big pilum handle hanging off because it's of no value. So the guy ditches his shield, now he's shieldless. And now you just slaughter them. The interesting thing about the Romans was that they had worked out in technology and organization this military might, this shock and awe, and this overwhelming ability. They had these ballista stones that were, that were about eight pounds a piece. They could, they could toss those things with these ballistas, these catapults, they could toss those things about a quarter mile at high speed. Nobody had seen anything like this or would see anything like this until there was uh, gunpowder brought into the scene. So the Romans had these incredible technological advances. By the way, they borrowed them. They were originally Greek. They just altered them and used horsehair bound together uh, that was, had a very good tensile strength and they would use that as kind of their, their uh, bands to pull back and pull back and pull back and then release them. Now my point is this, you're a Gaul. These guys come out and they have an overwhelming army. You're gonna lose. So in the process of the war, they, you know, they whoop your troops and you are brought in and you are made captive. The Romans decided rather than just keep uh, killing off all their enemies, because that's not really how you build an empire, what they would do is they would have a process whereby they would take this Gaul chieftain and turn him into a Roman captain. But to do that, they have to walk him through Romanization, or civitas is the word city. What city? Rome. Civilize him. To civilize him is to Romanize him. And so what they would do is take this, this dread-locked, wild-eyed, fur-laden, bone-wearing Gaul and turn him into a Roman soldier. They would make him a Roman. But very often, once they do that process, they're not gonna throw him out on the front line. He's not the first person who's gonna represent the empire. Uh, if he has a trade and he's a, a, an engineer, maybe they'll have him out there building aqueducts or roads as part of his, his you know, one hand has a sword, the other hand has a trowel, kind of Nehemiah-esque. But at the same time, a lot of them got stuck with lousy duty like guard duty. So I want you to imagine that Paul's sitting in Rome. There's a light chain attaching him to some guy who used to be a Gaul, who's now got a Latin name, who's now learned to be a Roman and has gone through the Romanization process, but he's not real happy. Why? Because he's a Roman, but he's a second class Roman. And right in the middle of that experience, looking at these second class Romans and listening to them murmur about how they don't get the best of anything and they don't get the best. You know, the guys who are out there fighting on the front line, that may not look appealing to you, but that's where the spoils are. To the victor go the spoils and the guys who are fighting on the front line can go breaking through and take gold and take jewels and bring them home along with skins. You know, they get to keep stuff. So if you're on guard duty, you're not keeping anything. So I want you to imagine Paul sitting there and he's dealing with these guys who are not happy about the work they're doing because they feel like they're second class citizens. And in the meantime, he's getting letters and delegations from the churches among the Gentiles that they are not happy about their coming into Christ, not because of Jesus, but because they feel like they're second class Christians. Do you see the parallel between the two? What's interesting is Ephesians is structured around some things that happen to a Gaul to become a Roman. In other words, this letter parallels two realities. It is how a Gentile becomes a Christian, but it's also how a second-class citizen Roman soldier 
came from the pagan world and was, or pagan world, they're all pagans, came from this, this uh, uncivilized world is the word I'm looking for, it came from this uncivilized world and was taken in and became part of civitas, became part of civilization. So here's what I want you to see. The book is broken down into three parts. And when you take a look at Ephesus, what you'll see are three boxes then. One of them is chapters one to three, and this will be the call of the believer. This is how a believer was called and what it means to be a part of God's kingdom as a called believer. And then 4.1 to 6.9 is the conduct of a believer. And that is how one is to act because they have been called. And then finally, 6, 10 through 20, and then there's a few personal notes after that, is the conflict of a believer. And that is helping the believer to understand what God has provided for them in the face of the conflict, spiritually speaking. What I want you to understand is that there was a process by which one was taken from the world at large and brought into Rome. And there was a process by where, whereby one was taken from the unsaved world and into Christ. Okay? These are two parallel things. Let me just talk to you for a few moments about how a Gaul would become a Roman. And I'm going to give you verses to parallel this with. You understand what I'm doing, right? So you're, you're using one illustration in the physical world to talk about a spiritual reality. This book really does set out like a living parable. Okay, in, in chapter 1, verse 4, one of the first things that happened when a Gaul was defeated, and I'm using Gauls just because they're easy, but they could be any number of peoples uh, that were defeated. It, what, the first thing that happened was that those who were left over from the battle, those who were remaining from the battle were chosen by families and given Roman names. You cannot be a Roman without having a Roman name. Remember that there, there is a, um, a prefix name, then your name, then a cognomen if you're a, 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 an important family or an upstanding family or an equestrian family, and then your birth name if in fact you are of extraordinary um, renown. So for instance, there's a guy named Gaius of the Julii clan, but he becomes important, he becomes a Caesar. So his name is Gaius Julius Caesar, but his title is Imperator, or he becomes this one with imperial um, privilege. He's a person who is able to lead troops. And so you end up with this long four-part name. Now, Gaius is his name. That's always been his name, and people would call him Gaius growing up. But he's of the Julii clan, and his clan name, his gents name, follows his, his regular uh, street name. You are given a name, a clan name, when you join or become part of the Roman people. You have to belong to a clan, and that clan has to be attached to a piece of land somewhere. So one of the things that happens is you are chosen by a group of people and you are given a clan name. This is the beginning of you becoming a Roman. And would you notice that in chapter 1, verse 4, one of the things that happened when a Gentile came to Jesus Christ was he was reminded that he was chosen by God, that he was placed into a family by God and that the word chosen. By the way, in verse 5, the way that's done in uh, Rome is you would be adopted by that clan. And in verse 5 in chapter 1, he's a, uh, there's a, <coughs> sorry, in chapter uh, 1 verse 5, he is, there is also an adoption that takes place. So let's say it this way. To go from being a Gaul to being a Roman, I have to be chosen by a family and given a clan name. I have to be adopted by them. To, go, to come into Christ, I have been chosen by God the Father and I've been adopted by him. In fact, the next thing that I am given is something that is terribly important to a Roman. I am given an inheritance. So I become part of a clan, and therefore, I have the clan's inheritance or piece of ground. Now, the way they did this was they gave you this little token chip. 
And usually you put the token chip and it was hanging on the end of your armor if, when you went out to battle. These little tokens were actually had Roman numerals on them and what they were were like a site or lot identifiers. This is your piece of land along the Tiber River. Now you're never gonna live to see it, okay? And 46 other guys have the exact same piece, but they're somewhere else in the army and you don't know that. All you know is that you have been given a piece of an inheritance and should you live long enough, you will actually get to inherit land that belongs to your clan or gents and you will belong to that piece of property. But here's what's important. You're a guy who has nothing. You have lost a battle, but in becoming a Roman, you become not only a Roman citizen, but you get a piece of inheritance. Now you're feeling really good about the whole idea of inheritance. And I would remind you that one of the things that chapter 1, verse 14 says, that is that when these Gentiles became part of the kingdom, it says, literally, he's given us a pledge of our inheritance. That's a token of our inheritance. It's the token that you would hang. And that token of our inheritance, spiritually speaking, of course, is the Holy Spirit. But for a Roman, this would be a small token that's literally put on their belt or attached to their armor. And so the third thing you would get after you're being chosen and adopted is an inheritance. Now, the next thing that has to happen is you have become part of something, but you don't know what it is. How do you know who to salute? How do you know the different ranks of people in society? Guys, if you know anything about the Romans, it's this. Everything, everything, everything was a spectacle to remind you of who you are in society. Where you sat, how many of you can picture in your mind's eye the Colosseum? Where you sat in the Colosseum and the size of your seat was determined by the class that you were in. So you didn't walk around with this kind of, I'm a part of the middle class, I think. You knew exactly who you were. You knew who was more important than you and who was less important in class. Class distinction was an art <coughs> form within Rome. So one of the important things is, how do I know how to be a Roman? One of the things they did was you went to a citizenship class. You learned basic Roman etiquette. You learned who is a senator and how do you know? You learned who is who in the army and how do you know? So as a Gaul, as this wild-eyed, you know, dread-wearing, fur-bound Gaul, you didn't know who the Romans were or how to eat or how to act in public. How do you act in a Roman bath? Where's the appropriate place that you're supposed to go? Where's the apodotarium? Where do I change, where do I change my clothes and what is it for and how does a bath work? Look, it's not just about hygiene, it's about civilization and civilizing you. So one of the things that happened is you would move from being chosen to being adopted to given an inheritance and then you go through a citizenship class. Now the next thing that would happen if I was a Gaul was I would probably have to, um, to, to learn some of the, um, the specifics of the society. And I'm thinking here about in chapter 3, verse 15, listen to these words. It says, um, verse 14, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father for, from whom every fam family in heaven and on earth derives its name that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. The point is that whenever you went through your citizenship class, you got to the end of that citizenship class and what did you do? You got something called the instatement of powers. The instatement of powers just means this. I am now fully a Roman citizen. We, we do this in America as well. People will you know, pledge allegiance to the flag, they'll take their little test, and they'll be sworn in as citizens. Well, the, the statement of powers is that you have now become part of the Roman family. And one of the things I think that he's arguing in chapter 3, verse 15, is that you have been instated with powers. That is, that you as a believer have come into the place where you are part of not just the families of the earth, you are now a Roman. You are part of the Roman family. And you will be strengthened to be a part of the Roman family. All I'm saying is that's a physical image, and this appears to be the pattern that he's following in the book. Now what's, in, what's important is, at that point, you should know who you are. So chapters 1, 2, and 3 address, spiritually speaking, who are you? You're a person who's been chosen, who's been adopted, who's been given an inheritance, who's gone through a citizenship class, who has been empowered to be a citizen. Spiritually speaking, let's apply that. 
You are a person who God chose before the foundation of the earth. You were adopted by him. And by the way, under Roman law, adopted sons had preference over natural born sons. Adopted sons rose to the top. That's why when Caesar Augustus was adopted by Julius Caesar, he becomes the heir. The adoption goes to put you first. So quite literally, by using adoption language, Paul is saying something incredibly important about these Gentiles that were grafted into the gospel and grafted into the kingdom and adopted by Jesus Christ. What I want you to understand is this. Your call as a believer, if you did not come from a Jewish background, was you were chosen by God, he adopted you, he gave you an inheritance, and then he put you in a citizenship class to learn how to grow up, gave you the token of his spirit, and that belongs to you, and now you have been stated with powers of the spirit of God, and that is what your call is. Very important for us spiritually to understand something. Your identity has everything to do with how you behave. My father used to say, you're a smith. Other people can, you can't. They can quit, you can't, you're a smith. Your identity has everything to do with how you act when you understand who you are. When you go overseas in a few weeks, I'm going to ask you not to look like loud, obnoxious Americans. You'll see loud, obnoxious Americans. I'd like you to not be them. It, it's amazing to me that I can be in a city anywhere around the world and I can spot the Americans. I, I, I'm just telling you that's the truth, and I, I'm hoping you'll blend, okay? And we'll talk more about that. But the important thing here is that your call is your identity, and understanding your call roots your identity. And I want you to act the way you act because you are who you are. By the way, you can't act into being who you are. You act because of who you are. So chapter 4, 1 to 6, 9 moves to the second box. And in the second box, the issue is not your, just your call, but your conduct. Would you take a moment and mark in your Bible a couple of words? I want you to see in chapter 4, verse 1, I want you to circle the word walk and underline the word worthy. And then if you keep going, go down to, to verse 17 of chapter 4. And I want you to circle the word walk. And this one's a little bit harder to do because what I'm trying to do, he gives you the negative. Walk no longer as Gentiles in the futility of their minds. I want you to, to simply make in parentheses the word wisely, to walk wisely. That is, don't walk senselessly, but walk wisely. Then I want you to see that there's yet another one. Go all the way to chapter 5, verse 2. Circle the word walk. And this time, underline in love. And then chapter 5, verse 8. Circle the word walk. And underline as children of light. And then in verse 15, circle the word walk, and then underline as wise. And what you're going to see is that you were called to walk worthy in 4.1, to walk distinctly in verse 17 of chapter 4, to walk in love in, in verse 2 of chapter 5, to walk as children of light in chapter 5, verse 8, and to walk wisely in chapter 5, verse 15. Walk, 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 walk. In other words, you need to learn how to walk. And the point of the conduct section is this. If a Gaul was going to be made into a Roman, one of the things he had to be taught was how to walk like a Roman, how to act like a Roman, how to buy and sell like a Roman, what are Roman laws, what is Roman decency, what is Roman behavior, what is a Roman family, what is a Roman banquet, how does one behave as a Roman in public, what is Roman modesty or immodesty, what is Roman worship and what's appropriate for that. So Paul's sitting there in a room writing the, 
to the Ephesians uh, next to a guy who maybe used to be a Gaul and he's complaining about being a second class citizen and one of the things he had to do to get the Roman uniform that he has right now is he had to be he had to be uh, chosen he had to be adopted he had to to get his token of inheritance he had to go through the civilization class he had to become uh, stated as powers and then he had to learn through that class how to walk how to get along in Roman society because there was a huge difference between the the Cardo and Decamanus system of these you know these um, um, four quadrants of a Roman city and where he used to live running around the woods in France or Germany. It, it, there was a huge difference between the way somebody got clean in a river uh, up in Germany and the way they got clean in a Roman bath. And he had to learn what civilization was. Look, the conduct of the believer comes on top of the call of the believer because when you are called, you change the way you are. So spiritually speaking, one of the things you had to do was you had to learn how to walk. Now what's interesting to me is that verse 1 of chapter 4 in the beginning of that section says, You've been given an identity. I need you to walk like you're in that identity. Walk worthy of that identity. Now, you need to understand that the scriptures are not trying to say to you that you somehow earned the position God gave you. But, but they are trying to say that because you have that position, you ought to walk a certain way. Let me say it this way. If you're a believer, I ought to be able to tell. If you're a believer, your lifestyle should show it. And so he says, I want you to do that. And what's the key issue in the first 10 or 12 verses of chapter 4 that he wants you to walk worthy of? How do you show it? You preserve the oneness, the unity of the body. One of the things that you had to learn as a Roman citizen is that Rome rules the world and we are one. And one of the things you have to learn as a believer is that there's a circle there's us and them, and the us is the believer, and the them is everyone else. And our objective is to try and draw them into being us just as we were drawn in one time, just as we once were at enmity. Now we're to be drawn in. It's interesting because in chapter 4, verse 17, the second of those walks was this whole distinct walk no longer as the Gentiles walk in the emptiness of their minds. Verse 19, given over to sensuality. You didn't learn Christ in that way. Verse 20, lay aside the old self. Verse 22, be renewed in your spirit. Put on the new self. Verse 24, he's trying to say there's a distinctiveness about the way you carry yourself in sensuality and in purposefulness. It is fine that unbelievers live an unpurposed life. It is not fine that believers live an unpurposed life. And finally, you get down to, by the way, one of the ways you have to do that is if you're a thief, quit. If you've been raging in anger, stop. Get a job. Look at verse 29 of chapter 4. Don't let any unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but edify with what you say. Don't grieve the Spirit of God. Let bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander be put away. Malice, put away, be kind to one another. The issue is this, if you're going to be a believer, you're called to act distinctly as a believer in your sensuality and in your purposefulness and in the way that you handle one another. Put off that other stuff, it belongs to another life, you don't belong there anymore. Well, in the same way, he goes on and says that we're to walk in love, just like Christ did, that impurity and immorality, those things belong to another life. We're not to be partakers with them, but we're to walk in love. But he says, not in lust, in love. Not in what the world calls love in every popular song, but real love. We're to walk in that. And then he goes on to chapter 5, verse 8, and says, stop walking like you're stumbling around in the dark. Walk as children of light. I love, I love verse 10, chapter 5, verse 10. That, that part of my life is trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. In other words, when I first start, I don't know what makes God happy, but I, I go on this journey to learn what makes God happy. And the important thing is that in order to do that, I have to walk wisely in verse 15, making the most of my time, discerning the will of the Lord, and that won't be discerned by anesthetizing myself into drunkenness. 
that will be discerned by being sensitive to his spirit and being subject to one another in verse 21. And then he goes on and talks about that subjection. All right, it, what's important for our imagery is simply this. After all of this happens, one of the things that I have to learn is how to be a Roman as a Gaul. How do I learn that? Well, probably the best way I learn it is what chapter 5, verse 1 says, imitation. Did, did you ever go to one of those banquets? When I first went on my first cruise ship, they had so many pieces of silverware or cutlery, I had no idea what I was supposed to use to eat what. So here's what I did. I watched people that had been there before. If you don't know what to do, just kind of sit there and talk and just keep your eyes out. Oh, that's the fork you use for that. They had these little things to get these little snails out of the shells. I never saw these things before. This is a weird instrument. I thought they were going to do surgery on each other at the table. They had this, like, they bring out this big, long thing, like, you know, a guy's going to come out and say, you know, uh, scalpel, you know. <laughs> it's like, you don't know what this stuff is for. And here's the important thing. What was exciting for me was if I watched somebody else, I could do this without looking like an idiot. Okay? Well, chapter 5, verse 1 says, listen, be imitators of God as beloved children. But I think one of the things that you have to learn is even after you've been given a statement of powers, you don't know how to act yet, so watch what others are doing. And then he goes on and he, and he talks about that imitation. By the way, we ended our little talk there with the submission that comes as a result of understanding the promotion of unity and the uh, distinctive wise way of walking. Can I just remind you that one of the important things you learned as a Roman was whose ranking was what? Do you see the words in chapter 5, verse 22, wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord? The word be subject literally means to deliberately rank myself beneath another. Now, I'm not going off on men and women right now. I'm just trying to get you to understand something. It doesn't say wives recognize he's a better person than you. He may not be. For many of you ladies, may I just say this, you're probably smarter than the guy you're going to marry. You will probably figure out that you're going to be married before he figures out if he likes you. In my experience, that is the way it works. You will meet him and go, yep, that's my guy. And he's like, oh, she's pretty. <laughs> she smells good. Now, we're not all dolts, but we're just not nearly as sharp as you. My point is that what you do, ladies, is not determine that you're not worth as much as him. We've already said that, that you are of inestimable worth before God. It's that you deliberately look at the relationship and deliberately place yourself beneath by the way, no one can make you. You have to decide that. Well, one of the things you have to learn if you became a Roman from the outside world was how to place yourself in rank beneath another. How to make the choice. Even though you may be smarter than him, he's wearing the toga that says he's a senator. So bow. That's just what you do. And my point is that this whole book seems to be laid over a set of problems that were very familiar to the people who were living at that time. All right, I want to move to the last one just so we can get uh, done this. You know probably the most actively discussed part of the book of Ephesians is verses, six, uh, verses 10 through 20 of chapter 6. And, and the reason that it is so actively known is because it directly engages the spiritual battle. But I want to go back to my illustration first. If I was a Gaul, and I was sworn in and given a statement of powers, and I had learned how to behave myself, I could then be enlisted at the rank of what I had, be, had taken from me. So if I was a captain among the Gauls, I could quickly rise to the rank of a captain among the Romans, provided I had done all of the steps necessary. But one of the really important things was this. The last thing they do is give you weapons. They don't just the first week go, oh, well, you used to be against us. Now you're with us. Let's give you weapons. So you go through the entire adoption and inheritance process before you get your weaponry. Now, in the weaponry that's here, you see that not all the weapons are listed here. The Romans were incredible about borrowing technology. 
One of the things the Romans did was franchise. Another one was it borrow somebody else's technology, do it a little better, make it a little cheaper, uh, make it work just a little bit better than they did, and then send it out and say it's Roman. And uh, one of the things that, for instance, the gladius, the sword, the, the broad sword that they had, the gladius actually is Spanish. And that's why it's called gladius hispaniensis. It's the Spanish sword. So most soldiers were issued something that was a gladius, which was a sword that was something that came from the Spanish world. The helmets came from the Etruscans that they had defeated way back uh, in the beginnings of the foundation of Rome between the 700s BC and the 500s BC. So you have these very interesting, well, actually much of the Etruscans lasted all the way up till just before, let's say, 200 BC. The, the important thing is this. They borrowed all the pieces of their armor. Now, let's think about that armor for just a minute before we close off our introduction to the book. We're going to come back and study all of it. But what were the pieces of the armor? The first one was what? The first one is a belt. And the belt had a unique feature. Can anyone tell me what the unique feature of the belt was? Well, now, we're, we're certainly hopeful that the belt in some way held up something because we like that. But actually, the most important thing was that it girded your loins. And it's interesting, because the belt that girded your loins had a point to it. I'm not using that poetically. I mean, it had a point to it. There was a belt with a shield. See, the tiniest girl in this room could take down a Roman soldier with one swift kick. Now, that's really embarrassing. You send out these guys, these big, muscly Roman soldiers with their pilum and their shield, and they march, and some little kid comes up and goes, boop, and then down he goes. OK, this is not good. So the very first thing they need is protection to the most sensitive area on their body. And here, it's called aletheia, truth. But I want you to put it in the active form, the belt of truthfulness. Because the most vulnerable part of a Christian is their truthfulness. How many times do you have to be reminded that you can lie to yourself so easily you can come to believe the lie you told yourself? Did you ever tell a story so many times that when your sister comes and says, that's not how it happened, you go, but that's how I remember it. You've been telling the story so often that you have come to the conclusion that it is what you have said it is, even though it isn't. You've lied to yourself, and the lie became the truth. Here's what's important. One of the things that they were told to put on every single day was the belt of truthfulness. Why? Because you are going to need a belt of truthfulness in order to, for you to be able to speak truth, hear truth, identify truth, recognize truth. Why? Who is your enemy? Who is the enemy you're suiting up for? The father of lies, the deceiver. So don't bother putting on all the other pieces of armor if you leave the belt off because he'll give you a swift kick in the truth. And you'll go down like a ton of bricks, having done all kinds of things to help you, but not the things necessary that are essential in order for this to really work. What I'm saying to you is this. The belt of truthfulness is the first one that he gives you, and it's a very, very important one. The second thing I want to point out to you is that there is a second piece of armor. What is the second piece? Breastplate. Now, this is a breastplate. What is the breastplate designed to do? What's that? Like your core All your organs in the core of your body are being protected by a breastplate because it's fairly easy. Once you basically mess up somebody's heart on a battlefield, they're not doing much. They're laying there and dying. Once you put a hole in their lung, they're not running away. They're not doing anything. So the breastplate is to cover over the heart and to cover over the vital centers of, of uh, the organs. And the important thing is, what is the breastplate here in the representation? The breastplate of righteousness. Now, I'm going to argue that there are some theologians that will disagree with me. I don't think he's talking about the breastplate of positional righteousness. I think this is something you appropriate or put on. Your positional righteousness was put on you. You don't have anything to say about that. You are righteous because Jesus is is your covering is it, God sees you through him. 
This seems to me to be the breastplate of right choices, meaning when you make right choices, you cover your heart for the future. Making a right choice now puts me in the right place next for the next decision. There are a lot of people who come to me and they want to know, you know, what's the right thing to do in this situation when they have made so many bad choices, they're not even close to right, and now I'm just trying to figure out what's going to do less damage. The, the problem is each one of those decisions that you make improperly makes a wrong turn. And after 27 of them, you're in the wrong city. The reason you're not making the right choice isn't that you don't want to, it's that none of the choices around you are even in the right town. You can be so far off track. A person comes to me and they're in their third marriage with, with uh, children from three different men and, they, and she says to me, what's the right thing to do? Well, the right thing, that corner was way back there. Now we're just trying to figure out what's going to be closest to biblical principles to do the least damage. Does that make sense? Breastplate of right choices means when I make right choices, I'm protecting my heart and protecting my future, and it's helping me. So I'm asking God, first of all, deal with the sensitivity that I have to deception and truth, and help me to see truth, speak truth, identify truth, walk in truth, and then I put on this breastplate of right choices because I need protection over my heart because if I allow my heart to slip, look, adultery occurs in the head before the bed every single time. If I let my heart slip, my hands will follow. That is true. And so the third one is what? What do I put on my feet? I've got this... I've got this very interesting problem with my feet. I have my feet and they're shod, hupodeo, they are, they are uh, bound under with something. They are bound under with the gospel. The gos uh, the, the, uh, a sandal that was given to a Roman soldier was bound over. But when he went out into muddy frontiers, he put something and bound it under. And the, those are cleats that are attached to the bottom of a sandal. You don't wear cleats every day. You don't wear them in the kitchen, clack, 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 clack. This is for the purpose of going into battle. And so because we know that we're in a battle, we, we affix our cleats. But what are those cleats? Again, you can read it passively, the gospel. But that's not what I think he's saying. I think what he's saying is your identity in the gospel. My argument would be, if I'm to put it on, that means it's something I do. And if I do, what part do I do of the gospel? Well, I didn't save myself. I only surrendered myself. And in doing that surrender, I put on and remind myself that I am who God says I am, not who my mama says I am, not who my boss who's angry at me says I am. I am who God says I am. Interestingly enough, he says, I want you to watch out for truth, watch out for right choices, stand in your identity. Now, if you drop your eyes down to verse 16, in the very beginning, it says in, in verse 16, in, in, it says, in addition to all. The interesting thing is, if I were going to take apart that phrase, I probably wouldn't say it that way. I would say that, um, I would probably say, when necessary. I would probably use it in a very different way. Much of the words of, in a, it's actually only a simple word for all, but the, the, the idea behind it seems to be that there are times when you're going right into the direct line of battle. When you're going into the direct line of battle, what do you do? Why do I, by the way, say the shield of faith is not something you put on every day? Because shields are not things you carry everywhere. This is not something you use in a non-battle situation. And, and the shield itself, there's a blocking shield, it's a thoron. The thoron is about, I'm gonna say it's about this wide and it's about this tall from the floor. It's maybe four feet by a foot and a half. Thorons are those funny red shields that they would carry into battle. And the important thing for you to understand is it's generally it's leather over top of wood. And it usually has a, a brass insignia in the center which is, is made to, to help knock people down or push them over and the, there's a rim on the bottom that usually has a metal tip so that you can literally pick it up and break the legs at the shins of the people coming towards you. 
But the blocking shield isn't supposed to be, I mean, you use it to block and push, but it's not generally used one-on-one. -on -one. When you see the technique used by the Romans, usually what you do is wrap your arms together through shields, and there's a row or a blocking wall of shields. And usually, the captain has a whistle, and he's using a whistle. He's got a plume on his head, so you know who, who you're taking leadership directions from. And they march forward, but they hold the line. Romans normally allow the uh, attackers to come right up to the line. They usually let them come right to them, and then they cut through them. They did not run after them. They positioned their shields. In other words, our battle is primarily a defensive strategy, not an offensive one. We go out into the world, and our very message offends them. But the idea is that we're not to go out looking for a fight. The fight's coming to us. You're not going to be able to avoid the fight. And when it does, lock arms with one another. In other words, when necessary, standing in my cleats with my breastplate of right choices and my belt of truthfulness, when it's necessary, when the attack comes, find a friend and hide behind the shields together. Pull it together. Get the blocking shields and the strongest believers out front and when they come, use them as a buttress to push against them and use it as a place to hide. So when they fire the arrows down on them, there'll be two kinds of shields, those blocking Thoron shields in the front, and there'll be some that are like tortoise shells, uh, testudo, and you'll you raise them up above your head so that the arrows glance off and don't take you from, a t from the top. And this one says, when under attack, get behind the shields, grab some friends, and then keep an eye on the helmet of salvation. Not every soldier had the same kind of helmet. The helmet that was of the leader was with a plume on top, and that plume turned and had different colors in it. The only way you can tell where your leader is is to keep your eyes on the plume. I mean, it, the battle's not exactly organized. These guys are coming at you. These guys are being flung over top of the Thuron shields, and the guys behind them in the second and third row are killing them. There's all this stuff going on, and I'm watching, listening for the whistle blow, and watching for the plumage on the head of my leader. The helmet of salvation does a couple of things. Number one, somebody once said, you keep your helmet on because it keeps your head from swelling. Right? In, your, in your helmet, you got to remember your head can't get any bigger. And in your salvation, you got to remember that you came to this with absolutely nothing to bring to God and him everything to bring to you. But in addition to that, the plumage on that helmet actually gives direction. And it ac actually uh, uh, protects you from anything that's coming up towards your head. One of the other things is that I, I'm supposed to have the protection of a transformed mind. The part of Romans chapter 12, verse 2, is that I'm to go through the renewing of my mind. And that that has to happen, not to be pressed into the mold of the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. And that's, that would be a, a head image as well. Now, let's just say the line breaks. And they start to get through. And they're coming down on top of us. You cannot pull out your broadsword and wield it. You start swinging a sword, and you're going to kill three of your buddies just trying to get one of the enemy. Okay, the last thing you want to do is be standing next to guys who are flipping swords around, okay? Somebody's going to really get hurt. So what do you do if you can't use a broadsword in close combat and the line is broken? On the inside of your leg, there is a small leather strap. And this is not the rumphaya, the broadsword. This is this small machaira. A machaira is a dagger, and it goes here. So that in the, in the text, the sword of the spirit is not a sword, it's a dagger. So when the line breaks and they're coming down on top of you, you pull out the dagger and you stick it in the enemy because that's what you have. What is that? It is the rhema of God. It's not the logos, it's the rhema. What's the difference? Well, the rhema of God is a specific word. So let me say it this way. In very practical terms, if the line breaks and the enemy's coming in, the word that you have stored up in your heart, the word of God that you have learned will become the tool of defeat. Jesus didn't do a study exam the day before he met the enemy in the wilderness in Matthew 4. But he answered him with the word of God repeatedly. How did he do that? Because when he wasn't under attack, he learned the word of God. 
Same as you're supposed to do. When you're not under attack, learn it. Memorize it. Make it a part of your life. And hopefully your journey this year will mean that you'll have more daggers at your disposal when the enemy comes in at you. And you'll be able to say, wait a minute, did not God's word say? You're not getting away with that. You're not bending me this way because I already know what God's word says. And then you'll grab your little diploma and hold it up. No, I mean, you know what I'm saying. And then it says, all the time, all the time, the battle has something going on behind it. And that's the prayer. Pray, praying always. At all times in the spirit, be on the alert. There are always people watching the flanks. There are always people watching for the enemy's next move. And the whole time that's going on, they're keeping on the alert and prayer is going up. And the power of the Spirit is being called upon. The resupply, the re-encouragement, the renewing and reinvigorating of the troops. All right, do you understand the imagery then? The call of the believer, the conduct of the believer, and finally the conflict of the believer, which really has to do with when one becomes a Roman soldier, they are dispatched certain things. Now, he never mentions the pilum. It's the most important piece of, it's, it's like a harpoon. It's a very important piece. That's just not part of the imagery he's going for. He selects out of the armor pieces that help teach a spiritual understanding. And he selects out of the process of Romanization of a an uncivilized person into Rome, the pieces that help his story. But I happen to think there's a connection between the two. And I would just invite you to kick that connection around and see what it does. 